Maybe I forgot to turn it on. So um, uh, Maslow admitted that even his upper echelon people that he considered geniuses and experts, most of them never became self-actualized. They just, his theory was great, it was great in theory, but it didn't actually come about. So I wanted to look at it, and, and the first page on this really, I don't know how much it has to do with what we're doing. Um, it's a, a quote from uh, Henry uh, Nowen, I think that's how you say it, or Nowen. Anybody know how to uh, say his name at the bottom there? Uh, somebody told me the other day, and I can't remember now, it's, but it, come, it was reprinted from the Abundant Community, Waking the Power of Families and Neighborhoods by McKnight and, Not and Block. And I'm just going to read it and then we'll go on. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. So what we're doing, these projects that we're doing, even the family, uh, marriage and family, is really about how are you going to create a space for your family that's hospitable to not only you, to your children, to your wife, your husband, to friends, neighbors, it, or you could even apply it to the community at large. Okay. It, this could be considered a community. It is a community to the extent that we <coughs> join together and believe in it as something different. This is very difficult to have a community when you have a police force. Should I put this on film? Where you have somebody policing you in authority who, who says if they say to you, if you confess, you be forgiven and then you're kicked out. That's hard. That is not community building. Or if someone says to you that it's all confidential, and it's not. That's not community building. It, you've got to have, that's why we put the uh, guidelines up when we work in this room, is because you've got to have trust. And to the level and extent you can build trust with each other, that's the level and extent you can have that I would call true community. Okay. So I'm sorry, I just got past the first line. I may not get to this today. Uh, it's not to bring men and women over to our side, but to offer freedom not disturbed by dividing lines. It is not to lead our neighbor into a corner where there are no alternatives left, but to open a wide spectrum of options for choice and commitment. It is not an educated intimidation of good books, good stories, good works, but the liberation of fearful hearts so that the words can find roots and bear ample fruit. It is not a method of making our God and our way into the criteria of happiness, but the opening of an opportunity for others to find their God and their way. The paradox of hospitality is that it wants to create emptiness, not a fearful emptiness, but a friendly emptiness where strangers can enter and discover themselves as created free, free to sing their own songs, speak their own languages, dance their own dances, free also to leave and follow their own vocations. And if you think about Luther's statement, <coughs> I believe it's associated with Luther, every man a priest, and it, it's in the Bible too as well. You know, he quoted uh, Paul, I think, that uh, we all became our own priests. I, I'm, I may not be right about that, but it, Luther did say something similar to that that every man's a priest. We don't need a priest telling us we have a connection with God is direct. It doesn't mean we don't listen to other people. It just, but what happens is in any organization, the tendency is in, in families, in classrooms, in campuses, the tendency is a fear that we're gonna lose control. Somebody's mommy is gonna call the vice president and say they don't like what that teacher's teaching in that class, and I've had that happen. Somebody's mommy, is going to, or somebody who pays a million dollars for a building is not going to like something that someone is doing on campus. So they, so they build in these rules and regulations in order to try to give you guidelines theoretically, but then the rules and regulations then become uh, uh, static. They're not dynamic. They're static. They're st you're kind of stuck with them. And what this is talking about is... Um, I guess I didn't finish it, is, is uh, what it's talking about is how do you, is, is create a place that's free, where you're free to actually ask the questions you need to ask, even if they don't make people feel comfortable. And trusting and having faith that if those questions are asked, there is a God who will show you. That I always believe that, I always say that 
I don't worry about AA just because they don't name Jesus as the higher power. Because if there is a higher power, which I believe there is, He is God and He is Jesus. And I don't have to make, him, make somebody else force them to say the words. If they're truly wanting to find Him, He will find you. I, I think He'll pursue you. And that doesn't mean I just put my rubber stamp on everything. There's people in AA that I don't, I don't be sponsors. I wouldn't want from a sponsor. Uh, but there's plenty of Christians in AA. It's not, and AA allows for the opportunity for people to do this. So, just for example. The paradox of hospitality is that it wants to create emptiness. I guess I did finish that. Not a fearful emptiness, but a friendly emptiness where strangers can enter, discover themselves as created free, free to sing their own songs, speak their own languages, dance their own dances, free also to lead and follow their own vocations. Okay, so that's just kind of an introductory. I used this in a substance abuse uh, training program. It, it was actually for uh, the ODAP people here in Oklahoma. Second page is the um, spiritual circle, and that's what we're going to get to today. <coughs> the spiritual circle. Uh, let me just shrink it down just a hair. You've got it in your handout. It's the second sheet. Uh, this is a model, a mental model, created by Sherry Wakeshutter Cruz, who is one of the, um, if you ever heard of Pia Melody, or uh, uh, you may not have, because this is the codependency movement in Minnesota. And it, what it was was a family systems movement, family systems therapist, who came in and said, it's not just the addict who needs to recover, the family needs to recover too. So she created this model as a way of thinking about ourselves in terms of different aspects. And the reason I like her model is because spiritual is in the middle. Okay, Instead of being another piece of the pie, which a lot of models are, spirituality is the center. And, with, and actually, I believe all of these things are spiritual. Okay, they're, they're all connected to the center. There's no, we're not really divided into a pot, right? There's nobody who's just... If, you, if you're talking about social, social has to do with mental and uh, choice-making, willpower. It has to do with feelings. Everything is connected. Even physical is connected to all the rest of them. But the, one of the reasons we categorize things, the only reason we should categorize people, and for that matter, anything, is so that we can study it and learn more about it. And we shouldn't just stick with one model. I, I believe there's multiple models that you can come up with that gives you a different perspective so that you can understand it even better, so you can analyze it from different ways. There's, there's lists of things that are just, just as much a model as this is, but I like this one because it, it allows for more freedom for you to design what's inside there. These definitions in here are just generalized definitions Mental could mean something different to you. Okay? Does that make sense? Is that, if I freaked anybody out, should I erase the video now and, and hope that they don't find me? Okay. Um, I like to think that I'm more important than I really am. I'm sorry. I, I'm admitting it. I confess. They, it's like they even care, right? Well, it's huge just psychology. Okay. That's what I hope. Uh, this one is about attachment. The only reason I put it in there is because we're going to get to that in a little bit. But we've talked about attachment in here. Right? Uh, there's the insecure, secure, and avoidant. And actually, there's probably even more. Again, this is just a mental model. It divides things up in certain ways. Uh, but these are different ways of thinking about how... These are different ways that people act if they tend toward one or the other. It's probably a continuum. There's nobody that's completely secure. There's nobody who's got perfect childhood connection because we don't live in a perfect world. Our parents aren't perfect. And you're not perfect. You can't. Your g uh, genetics are not going to interact exactly right if you just think of the genetics. But here's the thing is that we do know, and this has to do with uh, foster adoptions and those kind of things, we're learning more and more that um, you have a certain genetic makeup 
that will only actually fit, it will fit the best probably with your biological parents. So you grow up in a family as a baby watching people with very similar genetics interacting in the world and you learn to interact in the world the way they do because it actually works the best for you if they're operating correctly. The whole reason for having a foster care system <coughs> is, not being, is that somebody died or somebody's hooked on drugs and can't take care, you know, can't show you how to interact properly. But that doesn't take away the fact that if you put them in a foster home, no matter how good that foster home is, it's not going to be as good as if their parents were actually raising them. And most of us believe that. Most of us believe you shouldn't take, you hope you don't take people, kids, people's kids away unless you have, the absolute have to. And I mean, I'm literally in the DHS system, uh, you can have crap and stuff up to your shins in the house, they won't take the baby away because that's not considered abuse or abusive enough or neglectful enough. They'll try to help you, and they always, the, the idea is to have family preservation if possible. But a lot of times, the parents are so out of control that you don't have. So I just, let's go quickly past that because I do want to get to something else. Then there's another uh, sheet on here, an attachment sheet. To rotate it back now. Um, um, and this is from uh, my consultant, uh, her love hierarchy. Uh, she wrote a book that's really good. If you're gonna if you're gonna work with traumatized children, or adopt, or just if you're going to be you're going to be around traumatized children if you're around children because there's plenty out there they're here right on campus um, but the important thing to remember about this issue being in relationships for people that are we're talking about people who are either in the secure or are insecure or avoidant attachment section the important thing to remember about this issue of being in relationships is that when you love someone more than they love themselves you make them wrong, and they will nearly always attack you. Now, attack doesn't have to be physical, but can be uh, verbal, or avoid you. Then, you need to add to this something that I call the love hierarchy, which basically refers to the order in which people tend to believe that they're loved. What all humans want, and what you apparently only get if you own a dog, is unconditional love. That's her little joke. It's not really a joke. Because there are no human beings on earth that can give you unconditional love. You can't do it, and neither could your parents. We try. We recognize what it's like we were taught before. I can know in my head intellectually what it is, but there's always some condition that I'm putting on it. You've got to act right if I'm, you know, something that I may put on there. Um, because humans are pretty conditional as a species, what many people learn to settle for is acceptance. If you accept me for who I am, all my limitations and strengths, then what that means that you will love me, which is a pretty good, that's not a bad place to be with, in relationships. But many people grew up in families in which acceptance wasn't present, but approval was. So you hear approval junkies. You were loved if you got good grades, kept your room neat, and were well behaved, etc. And so you learned to become an approval junkie, a human doing instead of a human being. However, some people live in families that are all, aren't all that functional, and they learn that the only way to lo feel loved is to be right. There are also people who grew up in families in which they're never allowed to be right, so what they believe is that the only way for them to be loved is for them never to be wrong. Now that sounds like a very subtle change, but it's, it's a huge change. Um, and so the first two, or three, of course unconditional is what we get from God, and we give ourselves if we, if we can, but we all, you know, you hear, how many sermons do you hear all the time about um, we, telling you what, how God feels about you? Apparently we need to be told all the time that he, he loves us unconditionally because we keep putting conditions on him. We keep creating these kind of conditional um, images, mental models of God that then we judge our, beha our own behavior and God's not judging us at all. It's us judging ourselves, that kind of thing. So that's what the four concepts of God, and this turns into a punishing God, an unapproachable God, a conditional God, or an unconditional God. And the unconditional is what we hope we have. 
So we have to be reminded. So it says, I do have choices. I can have a God of my understanding. And that's taken straight out of a 12-step a model. Okay, so flip to the next page. Now we're getting to the meat of why I wanted to make sure that you guys got this before we went on. Let me shrink it again. You can see it. If you can't see it up here, you can't read this little print. But it's the model that... I, I took this model, I created this model from a number of different lectures that I heard at on-site, as well as some of my own, uh, what I was taught in school. I've given credit to most of the people I could think of that I was stealing the ideas from. Um, when we're talking about trauma, which is what we usually talk about in, in therapy or in treatment, uh, trauma doesn't have to be that you were attacked last night out in the parking lot. Trauma can be, it, it's relative to you, how you perceive what's happening to you. So a baby who's left to cry all night without being fed could perceive in their <coughs> own baby type perception abilities that the world is not a very nice place. And if, it, and if that happens over and over and over again, depending on that baby's temperament and how often how they interact with the world, they could per, develop that kind of an attitude, avoidant or insecure uh, attachment style. So that could be a trauma for them. And they wouldn't even, you wouldn't even know it. Let's say you had neglectful parents when you were very, maybe your parents were uh, drinking or, or mom was sick. It doesn't have to be neglectful in the sense that they, what we usually think, say mom was sick in the hospital and just couldn't take care of you. Like I told you about the, the mom who had cancer that went ahead and had the baby full term and then died of the cancer. Um, in some sense of the word, and then you know, on top of that, let's put on a layer of that, her, his dad was an alcoholic. And somehow God put this other, this really wonderful woman, his dad married into his life, and his, his mom was trying to get him some help because he was messed up. He was really struggling, this little kid. Um, so that was traumatic for him, but it wasn't anybody's fault. It was just what happens. Or, or a mom can be depressed and not, you know, just not be able to, to function in the way she would normally have functioned. So that could happen. And then there's some kids that bounce so darn good, you could just about throw them against the wall and they'll pick themselves up and they'll, and they'll be, like they'll be siblings in the same family that appear. And some of that's birth order. So some of it might be the amount of trauma that you got as a younger child or older child compared to the other child. But there can be kids with different temperaments. Almost all your kids will have different temperaments. I hate to, you know, break that news to you. But they have different temperaments that are less affected by the uh, neglect or the abuse. But let's just look at this in terms of, let's say you wanted to look at something in your life that didn't go as well as it could have. So you, we'll call it a traumatic experience in a family of origin. And what traumatic experiences do is it creates shame. So a baby has no way of separating out, that's my dad's, he's it's just an alcoholic, that's why he's hitting me, or that's why they're not feeding me, because they're crackheads. And it's not their fault, I'll forgive them and it'll be okay. They, have, they internalize it. Babies internalize these things. So in, in whatever level they can do that. They don't internalize it like you and I. They don't have ability to filter that out, it just happened. So, uh, it, it turns into shame, and that's from the attachment, pain, not being cared for, not being shown what a wonderful, beautiful thing, this creation, this creature that came into the world, just beautiful, un unbelievably a miracle, just showing up in the world, you know, and, and everybody should have went, ooh, ah, and these people couldn't do it, whatever that is. So there's attachment, pain, so that develops, that can be an insecure or avoidant role. Or roles are the victim. Persecutor or rescuer, that's a triangle or um, triangulation that can happen that we're, we aren't going to get into. And then there's the emotional. So emotional can mean you're, you're either blocking or flooding with emotions. So some people don't have any feelings at all. Some people um, cry at the drop of a hat or, or are extremely sensitive. And so what the shame does builds into us this idea of a fantasy. So we'll have this fantasy that maybe I can find the wife of my dreams over here who's just going to take care of me and everything. We're going to live happily ever after. And, or I can have a fantasy of uh, uh, 
some kind of, I'm going to feel good if I just find the right chemical. Because I learned that maybe one chemical works for a while and then it didn't work anymore so I switched to a different chemical. Or uh, I have a fantasy that if I just work really, really, really hard, everything's going to work out perfectly. Or if I have a, fa whatever that fantasy is, turns into, there's a ritual in, in, involved in it. So the ritual is that uh, I've got to find the most, I've got to find the right person in the world. And I'll, I'll relate this more to drugs because it's easier to understand. But it doesn't have to be drug, any behavior. So you have this fantasy uh, that uh, smoking marijuana is going to make me feel so much, going to ease this pain, this pain that I have up here. And it does, temporarily. It may work. That's why people keep doing it. It works. You know, it, it, it may have negative consequences, but they haven't found anything else that's going to ease that pain, or they haven't resolved the pain, so the pain's there, even if it works. The pain's there when you quit, right? And, and on top of that, usually there's consequences like peeing in a cup and getting kicked out of school, right? So now you've got not only the pain of this, the pain of rejection, the pain, it, it builds and cycles. So that's what happens here. You act out, you get caught, you return to your fantasy. Yeah. You have a ritual that you work up to. We call this a relapse. If, you, if you've been through treatment, you know what's going on. We, you relapse, you, you start thinking about doing it again. You, you start forgetting all the other things that we'll get into here. You have acting out, it creates more despair, and it's a downward spiral. Okay, it gets worse and worse, theoretically, in this theory. And the acting out, the trauma response that shows there at the bottom, it's not critical that you know that you can read that later. Now, <coughs> let's look at a resilience response. And this would relate to if you were wanting to look at something really positive. Um, the other one would be you could look at to try to enter. On the other one, The intervention comes right in here, where we stop this, we confront the fantasy, we go up here to this, and we, uh, we uh, address it. So the reality is, your mom and dad couldn't possibly give you what you wanted, and to, for you to have a fantasy that someday you're going to find somebody who's going to, no, you have to have a different idea about that. And we, that's what we'll use in therapy, if we were doing the, uh, these sociograms in therapy, you would take a picture of this, you'd create a picture so that you can confront yourself about that fantasy and come up with some different ideas as an adult. Because you're standing outside as an adult watching yourself as a child go through that. What do, what do you as an adult need to do with this picture? That's, what, that's really the ultimate... Uh, it's not always that way, that's just in that case, that, that could be one of the options. And it could be, one of the options could be in nothing. I'm not going to do anything about it, I don't want to do anything about it. And that goes back to the hospitality thing. I'm not here to try to get somebody to change. I'm here to show them the picture, and what you do with it is up to you. And I've got to give you that freedom, because if I tell you what to do, or you listen to me and you do what I tell you to do, do you own it? Are you buying into it, really? It's possible that you could. Sometimes you fake it till you make it. But it's better for you to actually, and it would be, you'd really be choosing it then, eventually. Because a lot of times, you'll have somebody tell you in a program, try this, and you'll go try it even though you're like, all right, I know it doesn't work, you know, whatever. But the fact that you try it and you get different consequences and you feel good about it, then you start buying into it yourself. So sometimes we do need people to tell us what to do. We get... But, but you're really choosing to do that because you've chosen to listen to them. And you're not, we don't want you just to listen just to get out of the program, you know, to get out of treatment. So you can do what you want to afterwards. You've got to buy into it at some level. Okay, so now we have what we call resilience response, and we call it a potentially traumatic event. Because this is what changed with all the resilience uh, research was discovered was that we all used to think that if you go through something like 9-11 or the French, you know, you all know about Paris being bombed, you go through something like that, maybe witness it or, or you have a brother or sister got killed or 
you're going to automatically get PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And if you don't, what they used to say is you're in denial. You're, you're, something's wrong with you if you didn't have that kind of response, trauma response. But what they discovered was when they started doing perspective studies, which means they, they accidentally, most of the time, were studying a group of people, something happened and they kept studying them afterwards. About 60%, and it's very consistent, it, it varies a few degrees, about 60% of the people that go through something like that don't have any trauma. Not post-traumatic stress disorder. They don't have a post-traumatic stress disorder. There's grief and sadness of the loss, and then they, get, they kind of get their lives back together and go on. Whereas there's, there's about four other trajectories, but it's only about 40% of the population that goes through that that has this. The, the rest we call resilient. And it doesn't mean that the other people are less than, and these people are resilient, so they're better. It just means that some people are more sensitive. We don't really know. They're, they're studying all that. But they, the, the biggest breakthrough was that these traumatic events, are. we need to change it to potentially traumatic events because sometimes you even think something's wrong with you. Like if you have a big loss and you don't feel the, the sadness or the grief that your sister felt or, you know, something must be wrong with me. Right? No, you probably just bounced better. You took it better. Or your position in that system uh, was easier to handle it. So you say I have family uh, origin, like I said, you have a sibling who went through the same thing you went through, but what we hope for in the family of origin is, let's say we're not talking about trauma, in the family of origin we have people, we have parents who, are protect, who provide protection, nurturing, belonging, trust, respect, truth, and honoring. They created that hospitality that we talked about on the first page. And in the, in the process of that, you develop Secure attachment, response ability, not the word responsibility usually is kind of negative, but respond, ability to respond rather than just react. Because people who are traumatized just react. People who are, are, have that strength inside, the resilience can respond. I choose how I act, how I'm going to respond to that. Uh, healthy boundaries, uh, options, negotiations, uh, seven health, oh, self care qualities. There's seven self care qualities. We don't have that in your packet. Full emotional expression. So I'm, I have the ability, this responsibility, to have full emotional expression. I can be sad, I can be happy, but if, you're, if you've been traumatized, <laughs> theoretically, if you're avoidant, you avoid your feelings. If you're insecure, you might be you know, throwing them out all over, puking them all over everybody. Um, but if, you're, if you have ability to respond, then you, you can respond in an appropriate manner and not be... Like, I can tell you, I worked on um, my son's death. And I can, right now, if I wanted to, I could get in touch with the hurt of that, the pain of that. That will never, that will always be there. But, but by going through a process of what... Uh, I've been talking about, I was able to, to uh, turn, I was able to recognize that my God is unconditional, my little boy is with him, and there's always going to be a part of him that's in my heart, but I, now I have a different, it may be a fantasy, I think it's a vision. My vision is that just like C.S. Lewis is uh, The Great Divorce, he's, there's a story in there that where one of the relatives is standing on the edge of heaven when the person passes. And he's going to be standing there with a full, healthy body, which he didn't have when he was a little, at about six months he got a vaccine, vaccination. And his autoimmune system went haywire. He died at about 11 months. He's going to be standing there with his full, healthy body in this place that's going to be so real that it hurt my toes to walk on, pick me up and carry me in until I get used to it. That's my vision now, that I, I have a vision of it that I can live with. But that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Or if I describe what happened that, that six months or five months that he was suffering in the hospitals and all that, that will always be a potentially traumatic event. But it's potential. It's not a traumatic event. It's not like I'm controlled. I'm most of the time controlling, pushing, it's not pushing me around. I can kind of I can bring it out, set it here for you guys to look at, and pull it back in. 
there's times when I get side when it hits me sideways. I mean, that's just I think that's normal. Uh, but that's normal, not trauma, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. I don't have nightmares about it at all. I don't have vision. I don't have hallucinations. I don't have panic attacks about about it. I, I feel set. Uh, I feel like I've got my vision dream. I res resolved it to the extent that I can here on Earth. So you have a vision dream. So you go. You guys are all have a vision dream for being here. I hope. Yeah. Right. So you're getting. The, you're learning the disciplines. You're getting into groups. You might get counsel. Yeah, obviously advisor counsel. Uh, I think one of the things that we try to do in psychology, and we don't always do it because it's not the system itself isn't individualized enough. But if I could, I'd have you sit down with one of my help helpers, and she would help you map out how you're going to get to college later on, like your master's degree and all that. And you get the education that you need. You start taking actions. You volunteer to work in the community in the in the field that you think you want to do to find out is that what they really want to do, and to get experience, and to be able to say to somebody, you know, this is what I did in college. I volunteered to do this. I didn't even get credit for it. See, that's what you want to. Get. That's that's a way to get into really good colleges because they want to know what you're doing. Um, one of the things I've read or heard from some. Uh, Gatto was talking about people, he went to the advise, ad, admissions director at Princeton, I think, and they said usually they want you to have three hobbies, and that's the only place they really find out anything truthful on a resume, <laughs> is what you put on your hobbies, because everything else you kind of beef up. But uh, physical hobby, uh, I can't remember what they were, but like one would be riding horses, because riding horses is something you, you got to know what you're doing, or sailing a ship. Or one guy rode a unicycle up broken down broken terrain, and kept a, a record of it. He made his own sport. That they let him in. He was from poverty, but he didn't have. He wasn't like all the people at Princeton whose daddy bought a building, and so they got in. Thank you, God. That's one way to get into Princeton. Let your daddy buy a building. Sure. Yeah, uh, because those people with wealth, they those and or your daddy was already a graduate of that. The, you know, was a member of a fraternity already. Uh, but they also turned out lots of valedictorians. You don't make it. So you have, you learn, you, so you make constructive, healthy choices. So that's what we were talking about. If you have a drug screen, you know it's coming. Um, you know it's going to happen by a random sense. So you have more of a, a chance of making a constructive, healthy choice. Now, do I think that people ought to just automatically get kicked out? Maybe not. We had counseling, right? A counseling center. We say you have to go to ten counseling sessions, do a drug and uh, a drug uh, education program here in town. Whatever. There's there's drug education programs they send you to if you're um, you get a DUI and the evaluation shows you're not an addict. You just drank too much that night. But see here, it's a no-no period. So it's not probably not going to. It's just I think there's better ways to do that. And then you end up with joy. Unliked and accepted. I have a friend named Gina Elias at Building Bridges. I'm loved and accepted by this person. We're colleagues. We're friends. We're friends. Our, our, my wife and her are friends. We, we, get, we have joy when, when you're with her. I'm in, I have joy being around her. I look forward to going to Building Bridges. And that leads back to my vision dream. So we brought that, that class here to school. We're, we're still trying to figure out how to do it. Um, so this just gives you a different picture of it, okay? And I used up pretty much the whole time. Um, here's what I want to do. Uh, what I want you to do is, oh, and look, I, this is the other thing. Look at what's in the middle of this. So I, I superimpose this, or put it in the middle, to illustrate that if this is healthy, if this has a lot of strengths to it, then that's, this makes this possible. That's what really all of this stuff is. It develops all this in the individual. That's the theory. It's just a model. So it's not, it's not perfect. But what I'm going to have you do to start today anyway, is I'm going to give you a sheet of paper. I've got some colored pens. Pass that out one to everybody. I'll just put one here on each table. 
got some extras to need them. And I want you to reproduce that circle. I'll, I'll take it that's in on your second page, that spiritual circle. Make, it, make, make yourself a circle. I can cheat. Watch this. This, this will be cool, I think. circle on the page and divide it up so mine won't look weird like yours will. <laughs> and you can label, just put social, physical, feelings, will, just label them. You don't put all this other stuff in there. There's some pins. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's that. Oh, this is no, yeah, I'm not going to be the whole page. Yeah, that's fine. It looks like I won't be doing it. Can you have me drawing a circle? Can't be a nightmare. Well, you know what? You don't get graded on how circular your circle is. I was like, it's not going to work out very well. And you can read on your handout what those mean if you want to. It's not as important that you take their meaning, her meaning, that you put in there, but it gives you ideas. And then what I want you to do is, I want you to take each of those sections, and I want you to draw symbols, not words, symbols of what your strengths are in each of those areas. Yeah, you can go ahead and put the word they label on there for the headings. That word. 